Why don't you go ahead and give a better introduction of yourself than I did, a brief background and bio, kind of where you are, your education and previous work uh, leading up to this part of your life. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I did my undergrad at uh, Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, uh, about an hour south, 45 minutes south of Cleveland. Um, and I did my undergrad work at uh, Bowling Green, and I got into communications uh, slash theater. So I was sort of a late bloomer when it came to the uh, you know uh, theatrical world. Um, and uh, but I spent about four years in New York, and that's where I was trained as an actor and studied with some uh, with wonderful teachers at a conservatory called the Michael Howard Studio. Uh, I also studied at a studio called the HB Studio, um, along with an actor named Austin Pendleton. Um, and so I had, and I had some really wonderful mentors uh, as well. So um, uh, training in New York, and then uh, shifted. We ended up moving back. My wife and I. I was. Um, uh, dating my wife and engaged to my wife, we ended up moving back to the Cleveland area. And you know the the the, the short bio thing, I guess, ties us into sort of how the work came about too. Because when I graduated college, uh, you know, I'm in I'm in uh, the New York metro area, so one of the most not only densely populated areas, but also um, just coming out of college and then getting hit with one the 2008 you know the, the crash. Uh, and then having student loans. So this was sort of this experience um, that I was feeling firsthand, and I think a lot of uh, millions of people across the country are experiencing, where you know our uh, students my age coming out of school came out to a different world than a lot of students previous to us, uh, where you were sort of experiencing layoffs at a mass level, mm -hmm. the, the, the mortgage crisis, um, the effects of debt, the effects of credit card debt, and, and all these different things uh, across the populace. So um, my wife uh, ended up actually having, she was working uh, in Monmouth, New Jersey as a uh, youth advocate programmer for, and she's a social worker, and they, right in 2007, like she got her job, and in 2008, psh, layoffs. So that kind of shifted our our perspective. So we were getting married. We moved back to Cleveland to do the wedding. And what do you do? And so that's sort of how, um, that's why I was geographically, but I started traditionally as an actor. I mean, I, I wanted to do, I worked in independent film, uh, off, off Broadway, you know, off Broadway, a theater, regional theater in, in a number of different states. So I started traditionally down that path, but, but truthfully in the last three to four years, um, it was the sort of the, the, re the reality of uh, the economic situation, not just for people in urban areas, but for people um, in the last five to six years and sort of coping with the economics of things. Um, and so what ended up happening was I tried to fuse the things that were, um, that I thought about that were stimulating and that were scary with like the solo form in theater. And so I, I was working on a number of different stories and monologues and that seemed to be sort of the form that worked best for me and that I got m most you know, response to. And so I kind of went with that and I felt it was important to try to do something where it wasn't just art for art's sake, uh, which I love. And I, I love the you know, consumption of art and what it means, but I always wanted to try, to try to, in an entertaining and digestible way, create work, write stories about what was happening on the ground level with people, um, not necessarily doing plays and, you know, a gigantic theater on the other side of town talking about themes that maybe people in the audience weren't dealing with. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be interesting to sort of, um, and it's not a new story, but I think it's, it's a harder way to go about it, but I felt like I could sort of fuse uh, storytelling and at the same time social issues. So that's sort of how I came about geographically, and that's sort of how I came into the, into the work and, and into the play. Um, what was your entry point to activism? Had you been an activist prior to to you know the engaging with the student debt issue, or was was this like your entry point and you went to it full force? Yeah, the uh, the art was art was the entry. So I think being uh, living in New York, um, there was sort of like a, a cross pollinization, if you will, of of artists, but then, you know, you're, as an actor, you're around musicians and you're mm -hmm. around, you know, philosophers and you're around, um, you know, I remember my mentor, um, his name's Joe Grafasi, he's actually my, my cousin, and he was an, he's a longtime actor. He uh, introduced me to this place, I don't think it's in existence anymore, it was called the Philatetes Center, uh, and it was this really cool place in New York where um, 
they would bring artists and activists and intellectuals and organizers together around particular themes. So it was actually those type of experiences that got me more centered in the activism world, but, but specifically around education and higher education and student debt. It was literally my, um, not only my experience with it, meaning, you know, wow, there's this ridiculous amount of debt that my wife and I have, and then looking around at my contemporaries and going, boy, I'm not the only one, and then going, wow, there's like $1 trillion in debt. And then you start seeing that we're the first generation of college students in this country to do worse off than our parents. And so you, uh, economically, that is. So I started kind of seeing that. But it was actually my transition back to Ohio. I took a, I took a Band-Aid job uh, at a uh, for-profit university. Uh, and it was the only job that I could find. And I needed to pay my own student loan debt. So the entry level into the work was literally this scenario, that I was a student debtor, an artist, uh, transitioning cities, needing to pay my own student loan debt that came up, and then taking a job at a for-profit university where I was putting young people, at-risk youth primarily, into debt in order to pay off my own student loan debt. And that sort of irony was the thing that was like, that was a question enough to say, you know, this is worth more than just, you know, a piece of art. This is worth creating something. And then I started creating networks and ties within the activist community. Um, and not, not just to support my art, but to literally just to actually have something uh, to do with the other hand, so to speak. You know, as I'm mm -hmm. doing this play, what can I do directly in terms of organizing, in terms of, you know, thematically taking on this issue and then connecting with people that do. So I ended up getting in touch and then co-founding uh, this organization called Student Debt Crisis. And so myself, my colleague Robert Applebaum, who created a petition that got, I think, one point, and is still growing, 1.6 million uh, signatures. And he helped co-author a piece of legislation called H.R. 4170, which is a Student Loan Forgiveness Act with former Representative Hanson Clark. And so my kind of work has been tied in primarily with, my, with the arts, but at the same time I have my hands in the organizing and the policy stuff and generating media and awareness through this organization. So it's kind of like a perfect marriage, but it was actually the art that got me into the into the activism and then my own life, I guess, looking at the looking at your significant other and seeing sort of the economics of of the world uh, and specifically um, our lives. So that's kind of that was my entry point. Um, I, you know, I can see there's going to be a lot of, of little tangential parts here because some of the things you're mentioning are fascinating. The first one here is that um, you kind of have come to this situation, uh, the 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 writing and performing of the play as part of a greater whole where you're you're investing energy not only artistically but on legislation on direct action um like this is this is your thing you know combating and informing people about the student debt issue is your thing and you're approaching it holistically is that is that conscious or did it just kind of evolve that way well i to be completely honest i um, it was primarily when I was writing the piece, I was trying to figure out a way to who's going to watch the show. So it was in the show itself, the nature of the show, as you can tell me, I'm, I'm, you know, I can tell by the interviews that you've done. I mean, you're interested in the social and, and that doesn't mean that the social can't be entrepreneurial or can't be beneficial, but you're interested in having discourse like this. Uh, and I think the the same reason why I wrote the play. So the play itself wasn't a, wasn't like, you know, this isn't like a, let's get to Broadway kind of thing. Right. This was like, but at the same time, how do I, with a, with a material like this, how can I engage um, an audience member? Because I know, I know it's important and I felt confident with my work as a performer. Um, that was the strong suit, but how do I get people in the room around something that's kind of um, kind of dangerous in the sense where it kind of it's you know uh, you're not it's not just you know a tagline about yeah go to school and everything's going to be okay. It's kind of like wait a second here are these layers that are happening and a lot of this stuff that's going on is really dangerous uh, and can be actually counterproductive to our economy. So I think I think where it came from was that was the entry point, but I started creating those relationships because. Um, one, I was doing research on the piece. So not only did I have mm -hmm. my own research working, um, I spent I spend meticulous amount of time making sure that when I do work or create a monologue or a, or a play like this, that there is enough research and that it's not just a guy on a rant. 
that I could blend my experiences because I wanted it to serve in a couple of layers. One, I wanted the experience of the show to be a specific experience at a for-profit school. At the same time, you know, having seen or heard the work, there are all these other themes that come up from it, you know, ethics in the workplace, a modern day capitalism, uh, how we treat students, debt, uh, all neighborhoods, you know, uh, you know, uh, race relations. There's all of these kind of new little themes or tangents, like you said, with this conversation that come up in the play. So then the question becomes, how do I, um, how do I get holistically approach that in a, in, a, in a genuine way? So it was through the research and it was through trying to gain the, uh, an, into an audience that was willing to support the show, not financially, but support it thematically. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that search that then got me connected to these different organizations. And then what I ended up finding out was I could work with the other hat, so to speak, in, in an organizing vein, in a, you know, uh, bringing people together, uh, coordinating events and things like that. So it, again, it luckily, it was, um, it was a, a conscious decision uh, but it was actually, again, through the art first, and then I started seeing not just the benefits to the work, but I, I think this kind of work uh, goes, has to go hand in hand with that. It, I don't think, obviously I think the show could, in a way, stand on its own. I think it does artistically. But in terms of what I want to do on a social level, I needed to have my other foot in those doors right. um, organizationally. And so that was sort of the, I guess the, the plan behind it, so to speak, but it, but it worked out in the sense that they feed each other. Mm -hmm. And in watching the play, uh, it wasn't very long into it. And I was, I was like, this person has either lived this personally or has a direct relationship with somebody it has because the material was so substantive and so well researched and so factual, but it was de delivered in a, in a narrative that was digestible. Um, and, and it was like, there's, there's no way you could just do that as an abstract. You had had to live some of it. So it's interesting to hear. And I want to touch, touch a little bit on, on the fact that, um, you went to work for this, this for profit. Um, yeah. so it was, it was, um, work out of necessity, obviously. Sure. How long was it before you started encountering cognitive dissonance by being, involved in that type of system because i would think it would be hard when you're when you're carrying around you know your own debt and you're trying to address that but then you go into a job where your job is to generate debt for more people and just like how how did you i mean that's difficult to do and i know it's it's necessity because you got to make a living but how did you reconcile that that that's the and I think you're right. That's the thing. The the core of the play is the is the the dilemma, the the moral dilemma. Um, because again, I came into it pretty ignorant. I truthfully didn't know when I took this job, and this was just I didn't know the difference between a for profit and non profit school. And I, I, I consider myself, you know, you know, a thoughtful guy. You know, um, you know, studied. I do research. But I and I think I've realized a lot of people really smart people didn't even know the difference, really the difference between a lot of these, you know, um, for-profit schools, specifically the big ones that you hear about that are sort of like diploma mills, uh, and then, you know, your traditional public university, and then a private university, but, you know, that stands differently from a, from a traditional for-profit. So I didn't know about these things. And so when I, it was the first day that I had the dissonance like I knew, and it was the training that I had that I highlighted in the play where I went out of town for this training and it was like, it was like sales training. And they, when they talked about, you know, how you, how you treat people and how you have to get into their soul to really, and I'm going, this is like, this is unbelievable. Um, and so I knew the first day, however, there's this, so then there's this other side, which is like, okay, you know, are you just being you know, you too concerned with just, you know, justice that you're going to now default on your own loans or you're going to put your, you or your wife at risk or, mm -hmm. uh, and again, and so, it, you know, in, in a world where I didn't have that type of debt, and I think this speaks to the larger theme of it, in a world where, not a perfect world, but in a world where we don't have this type of ridiculous oppressive debt on people, I think they're more free to make moral decisions. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're always going to. Right. But I feel that most people genuinely, and I, I'm one of the people, that, you know, positively, that people will choose the, 
the moral path and just the sense of like, you know, doing the thing that's not going to harm someone. And so for me, it was specifically because I had this student loan debt. And so even though there was that dissonance the first day, I said, hey, look, I'm going to stick this out. It's not going to be forever. You know, once I get this or once I, you know, get a job in this theater or this show goes, you know, then I can transition to that. But so I knew it wasn't lifetime, but at the same time, the, I, I have to, and I, I, I have to also highlight the pressure that you get from having any sort of student loan debt. I mean, the type of phone calls and the type of, um, you know, uh, that you get six, seven, eight times a day from different numbers when you're either behind on the payment or maybe you, you were able to pay two out of three of them. Or, so it was this sort of like, and again, the combination of my wife losing her job and her trying to find a job and tra moving, it was just, it, it was a necessity. So I, I decided that even though I felt uncomfortable about this, that I could find a way to possibly have some sort of like moral existence in this really weird place. But it wasn't until the few, I would say three or four months, where then I started to see the entire world, the landscape of what was happening, the landscape of what I was asked to do. And it was at that point where I go, you know, student debt or not, defaulting my debt or not, um, you know, economic struggle or ruin or not, you know, those fears, I can't do this anymore mm -hmm. because this is, again, not only not me, but it's not worth being financially looked upon as like, oh, he's savvy, he can pay a student loan debt. I would rather default on every loan that I had than, you know, put another person or hurt another person. And I, maybe that's just me, but I just couldn't, I, was, I couldn't sleep at night. It was really, it was tearing me up. So that was sort of the dilemma. At the same time, you know, like you said, you know, not only making a living, but rent for your, your apartment and all these right. things. So I think that was sort of the, that was the back and forth. And eventually I think the, the, uh, the other thing won out, the idea of, you know what, even though there's this fear of, and even the reality of possibly not having a job if I quit or, or, or in being fired or let go or whatever, which I eventually was, I, I have to, I can't behave in the, in the way that they're asking me to behave. So what I try to do is sort of modify my behavior after even halfway through my tenure there. I started trying to, you know, operate in the way that the job description said we were supposed to operate. But the ironic thing about that was as soon as I started behaving in a way that I felt, you know, was not only natural to me, but really was what it said in the job description, um, my numbers for enrollment plummeted. And I think it just shows, at least in the nature of those type of institutions, it's not an institution built on retention or, you know, quality, so to speak, of education. Mm -hmm. It's built on short-term economic gain and getting as many warm bodies in a single place as possible so that they could take their federal funding. And that's just not a world I wanted to live in anymore. Right. Um, it, you know, to listen to it, it sounds so much just like, you know, um, day trading or anything like that where the thing is to churn that's that's what matters more is to turn over to turn over to turn and uh how difficult that must have been um and i i think it's wonderful that from that experience now you pulled information out of it that you you can do some substantive some substantive good some teaching some informing and some enlightening so um you know good for you good for you for being able to do that um, I'll come back to my question list. Uh, I want to get a little bit of a broad picture of this concept of yours of soul, solo theater for social change. Like, what was its origin and how did you decide on that specifically as a platform for your work? And had you done any pieces previous to for profit in that vein? Yeah, so about two or three, I'd say three years ago, I started working um, just in the form of doing solo work. And I think, again, that came out of necessity. I mean, being an artist, being an actor, uh, and kind of going a traditional route, there was sort of this cattle call mentality where, you know, you're trained and you're connecting with people, but you're going to auditions. And, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to get a number of different jobs, um, work in television and independent film and things like that. But truthfully, it was... Um, being, you know, you kind of set out sometimes to do something and your expectations of it are one thing, and then you actually get maybe a taste of the world that it's in, and then you go, boy, that's not exactly what I thought it was going to be. And I think for me that's sort of what happened. And not to say, I mean, any way I, I love 
tradition. I love movies and art and theater. I still, you know, am open to do that kind of work. But for me, there wasn't a sense of like, uh, I didn't get the sort of satisfaction that I thought I was going to get. And then I started writing um, monologues and I started writing, uh, doing solo work. And it was just here and there. So I was doing it in different places in New York and workshopping them, um, you know, readings where you'd bring like, you know, 10 people in. And then I, I over the last five, previous like five years, I'd really studied other artists that I really liked. And that form, that storytelling form was, I think, something that was natural in my, my temperament. Uh, but I sort of resisted because it was not a mainstream approach to to acting. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not, you know, it was sort of, you know, in the audition rooms, you know, there was a particular thing that people wanted to see, and I spent, you know, five years trying to be Marlon Brando and all that stuff. So, but I think my temp when I was honest with myself about my temperament, I related more to storytellers who were great actors, but who were like you said, who told a narrative, and uh, you know. Uh, John Leguizamo was a, a guy when he was younger that I watched a lot. And uh, there was a guy who, uh, Spalding Gray, who was a great storyteller and was a bit more still and a little bit more neurotic. But he had this wonderful way of, 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 of telling stories. And then I started seeing, wow, these, these people, uh, Anna DeVere Smith is another woman who's been doing it for years, and she does documentary solo theater. And, uh, uh, and Mike Daisy is another guy, kind of a sit-down storyteller who kind of does extemporaneous monologues. So there's, there's really few of us. Uh, there's a lot of people who do solo shows, but there's very few of us who do it consistently. And so when I saw these folks doing it, not only was I attracted to the way uh, that they were working, but I started crafting my own sort of style over, over a period of you know, two to three years, doing monologues. Uh, and then I was commissioned to do a couple of uh, pieces uh, here in Cleveland. Um, and one of the pieces was at the Cleveland Public Theater. Uh, and it was sort of a, it, it was a take on... Uh, geography and how the geography or the landscape of a city or an urban area, how that has an effect on people's identity and their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, things, again, these are things I'm always thinking about. So that, again, and then that was received in, in, a, in, a really well, in a really good way. So what I started noticing was, you know, people were coming to my shows, then different places started commissioning or paying me to do it. So I felt at least that gave me the, the confidence to write a more complex piece. Uh, so I was still workshopping things and then working at that at the for-profit school and that's when it was like, you know, I'm going to really kind of take on this endeavor. So I had done a number of different readings, monologues and shows, but um, but nothing as complex as as for-profit. So this is really my, I think, my first complete uh, and detailed, uh, you know, solo work. And I think this is going to be sort of the vein that I work in from here on out where, you know, um, it's connected to the social. Uh, and that, you know, it is that, that it's not just theater that, you know, because I was always not satisfied when I would go to a show and leave. And then you have all these questions and you talk with your family about it and that's great. But if it's something tangible that you can do, if it's something like, you know, health care or, um, you know, or higher education or uh, communities or poverty or things like this, something that you can actually do even in the short term, why not try to use that as a way to to kind of bridge that gap or what I call like, you know, building bridges to solution building. Yeah. So, and so and a lot of the partnerships that I talked about with like student debt crisis um, and, and a number of organizations who, who endorsed my work, you know, Young Invincibles and, uh, you know, Occupy Student Debt, uh, Rebuild the Dream. I worked on initiatives with, with, with them and, and things like that. And they've been really supportive in terms of building a network around the show, um, you know, that's what I want to do with those connections is that after the show, if someone say, sees, hey, you know, I really I want to be more aware about this or I want to actually participate in some way, then at least I have resources to provide them. So mm -hmm. that it's not just, you know, it's not just awareness for awareness sake. Right, that right. Awareness, but that you have some sort of, I guess, uh, a path to take if you want to if you want to take action yourself. Yeah, really important because your show is an entry point for people who may or may not be familiar with the subject. So you, you get them in, you do the show, they're like, oh, wow, you know, in their head, and they're primed to do something else. So having that resource avenue for them to engage deeper is really critical and really important. And, and I want to pause here and, you know, I'm watching the chat, and I think it's important, and I would love for you to know this, that we had a, a good many viewers that night, I mean, for our channel, and, and without... I mean, without fail, people were like, oh, my God, this is so good. This is so informative. You know, one of our 
our longtime viewers was like, I just tuned in and I didn't think there was going to be anything there that really spoke to me. You know, they were just, and they sat mesmerized for the whole show because even though they don't have student debt issues, they don't have kids with student debt issues or, or like the specific topic is not their topic, but the way you presented it and the information you presented it was so valuable and everybody has just gone. I mean, they're so complimentary. They're all telling me to get get it in, get it in here. And so um, your show reaches people on a lot of levels, not just people that have an intimate knowledge of student debt. Um, I was thinking during the course of the show, oh, you, you could substitute everywhere you reference student debt and say mortgages or, you know, anything. I mean, it, it's a universal issue, right? And so your show lent, you know, some light onto that topic. And I think it really, really reached people. And I think that's incredibly, incredibly valuable. And, you know, we talked offline and I'm, I'm all about using the stories to, to help educate and inform. I f firmly believe in that. And I love the examples of the other solo performers you gave because they're, they're not only entertaining, but they begin dialogues, you know, right. and that's, that's so important. And I want you to talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, back to for-profit specifically. Um, we kind of got a sense of the conception and development. Um, can you just give us a little bit of insight into the, the production and the touring? You know, how, how many shows are you doing? Do you feel like it's getting some traction and successful? And what is, what is your personal goal in presenting that show? Yeah, so I've done, up until this point, I've done... 39 performances in five states, and, and we're coming up on almost a year, so less than a year. Um, so, I mean, I couldn't be more uh, satisfied with in terms of the scope for, for the type of budget and the type of independent work that it is and the type of social work that it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, you know, just really a lot of work went into it, but I'm satisfied with the sense that it's been, um, it's sort of expanded in that way. Um, the uh, so yeah and, and we've and again it's just and again it's continuing to sort of grow more so we have shows um, uh, all the way through uh, May up until the beginning of summer uh, and then and and how that how it's worked was I so I'll I'll go back uh, and I'll try to be as brief as possible so when I started it um, you mentioned too there's sort of a, it's it's a difficult piece to sell uh, it, it could be the you know I could be the greatest actor in the world but when you do a piece like this. You know, especially you know, one, where are you going to get the funding? Um, two, um, who's going to stick their neck out for that? Um, and so, what I, I sort of had a, uh, I kind of I decided to create sort of a process where I was getting feedback from other organizations, teaming up with nonprofits in a way to represent the show, even if they weren't doing it uh, financially, uh, where they could sort of just prop it up in terms of, hey, this is an interesting story, and this could spark conversation for something. This could be something where we have some, you know, uh, solution building in an innovative way, because like I say in the play, I think we get hit all the time with numbers and facts, and don't get me wrong, they are important, we need them, but I think we're really numb to that stuff. You know, how many retweets of a New York Times article? I mean, this is great, but there's nothing better than when literally someone is standing across from you telling you a story and if they're a good storyteller man you feel that you you actually feel the what it's like to be in that office or what it's like to be in a moral dilemma or what it's like to be you know in a in a, in a poor neighborhood or someone who's just trying to get out of poverty and then right when they think they do you know they get duped into a huge loan that destroys their family i mean when you see that up front i think it humanizes it and so what I started doing was I was touring it to theaters at first. So I couldn't get anybody in the Cleveland area, any theater, to, to put it up. So I worked with a, a production company. Their name is Darren Hope Studio. And they were a small upstart production company, but they had this really nice space. So I put the show on myself. Um, and we, we, we did it for a weekend as a way to preview the show, to get it on its feet, mm -hmm. and to see who would come. We ended up doing the show in like an abandoned mall, 30 minutes east of Cleveland. 
And we had, like, amazing turnout three nights in a row. We had, like, 40, 50, 50, 60 people come to these shows. And, again, it was, you know, I really worked to get the word out there. We, I had some friend, wonderful um, friends of mine uh, at NPR, the, our, our, excuse me, our, um, it's the NPR affiliate WCPN and 90.3 in Cleveland, and they did an interview about the show. And so we got some press about it, and that we were able to fill the, the seats. After that, I ended up getting in touch with a colleague of mine in New York, they run a theater called the Seeing Place Theater, and it's uh, it's a great spot. It's off off Broadway theater. They're doing some really innovative work, but they were a young company, and so they were approachable. I could say, "Hey, I'm doing this work," and so I premiered the play. Ironically, most people spend their whole. I premiered the play in New York, <laughs> off off Broadway, and so and and what was great was uh, I, I did the off nights, but I I did six shows, and 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 then through that we. I ended up getting on like the, they for tourists in New York they have like a, like a Times Square list of things that you should see, and somehow I don't know how it happened. My play ended up being on this list. Uh, it was way at the bottom, but it brought people to the play that probably wouldn't have come. And then after the show in New York, uh, I got there was a, a, a bunch of press that happened. So like uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education wrote an article, Huffington Post wrote an article, and Campus Progress wrote an article. And this was. Me, as an organizer, it didn't just happen. I was really pushing this, not just to uplift the show, but to say, here, we're taking on this particular issue, mm -hmm. right? And so I worked for a long time to kind of create networks and to have people, you know, uh, uh, publicize the type of work we were doing and Student Debt Crisis was advocating for. So, it, so it, at first, the first three months of the show was about doing, like traditional theaters. What I decided to do after that, at the end of the summer, was to create shows where we were tr primarily touring at universities because I felt that uh, not that we weren't doing theaters but primarily going to universities because it, it, it provided us with like a, a fertile ground to be able to enact that activism um, and so and on top of that I wanted to make sure that I wasn't charging for the show I didn't feel right doing the show and talking about student debt and then charging 20 bucks a ticket so what I was able to do is we kind of created a funding model where we get organizational support from university groups, um, departments, student organizations that see value in the work and helping that align with their mission. So they provide the funding, the artist fee, and the funding for the show up front, and then we can provide the show free of charge to anybody mm -hmm. in the community and in the public. Because at the, at the same time, again, if this was my show, this was like, you know, my crazy Italian family show, sure, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll charge 30 bucks, you can see me perform and you might like me. But with this particular issue, I felt it was important that we get as many people, like get as many obstacles out of the way for people to see the work. Um, and so that's sort of how it went about and we've been lucky enough to, I've, like I said, I've done it 30, you know, nine times in five states and primarily at universities and, and theaters in those communities. Uh, and our next upcoming shows at Ohio University, uh, which is great, we're doing kind of a micro tour of Ohio. Uh, you saw the College of Worcester will be at uh, Ohio University, um, and then back out to uh, to New England for a couple of shows, um, and then uh, again that's so we have we're booked all the way through fall of this coming fall through fall. Excellent, excellent. So it's been it's been it's been really it's been cool. A lot of hard work and a lot of kind of finagling and trying to you know figure out how to kind of cobble together a tour. Uh, but the great thing is it's a solo show, so it's low production. You know, it's in, in oh, I say low production. Just you don't have to like have trucks with you know smoke and you know lights. Right. It's me, a chair, and in a, a, a stage. So that's the value of it. It's a low cost for someone to present, and I think high value in terms of the content. Okay, um, I want to ask you a question about Worcester College, and and if I'm not to put you on the spot, and if you can't answer it, you can just say. Sure. But we were we were wondering. Um, did you encounter any kind of you know resistance from the administration to get the play put on at Worcester? And then what kind of support transpired in order to overcome any obstruction you might have had? Yeah, so if any of the schools that we work with, and this isn't to, to stereotype, but I, I would say that the, the type of data we were getting was if you go through the unit, the, if you go through the administration, there's not a chance they're going to have this show. I mean, whether they're a nonprofit or they're a for profit, they, the, the, again, if someone wants to prove me wrong, I have any, anybody from a university or administration office call me right now because I've been doing it for a year. And 
no responses from the administration, administrative types um, to ha even have this dialogue. The people that want the dialogue usually are the professors, the adjuncts, the students, and the organizations in between. So and even the community, those are the folks that want to have this conversation. And, um, and fortunately, but unfortunately, they have to sort of go through the administration to actually get it done. So I have actually, ironically, I haven't had any sort of um, resistance at any of the schools I've, I've, I've performed at um, up until when we were at Worcester. Uh, there was a student group there, the Worcester Student, uh, Worcester Student Association or, or Worcester Student Union, I'm sorry. They were like an emerging group. But they were a really group, really dedicated group of students who wanted to have the show and wanted to have this dialogue. And so they pushed for it at first. And for one reason or the other, I don't know definitively what, but for one reason or the other, there was an issue uh, and the administration didn't feel my work was properly vetted or that they, even though we had had, I would say four or five, six months ahead of time where we were or talking about this. Um, it, it's something where, you know, I kind of just got a sense of, okay, wait a second, our, the show was planned. And then all of a sudden we got like, a, oh, you're not doing the show. So what I ended up doing was, instead of, you know, I was really angry about it, but what I decided to do is I went down to the school and kind of worked as like a diplomat, and I had meetings with various deans and various people to basically smooth things over and say, look, you know, these students wanted to bring this, they've been working really hard, this is a show that I'm doing, I'm an independent contractor, I've been doing this around the country, and we were able to come to an agreement uh, to, be, to be able to host the show. I will say, however, I was really disappointed in the sense that they – um, that again, and you saw too, the show is not militant at all. The show isn't something where we're attacking a specific university. Uh, I don't even mention the name of the for-profit. I, I, uh, I worked at it, one for legal reasons, but also to be respectful of the people that worked there, even though I disagreed fundamentally with everything mm -hmm. that they did. Mm -hmm. I really don't think this is like, you know, the monopoly guy who is the bad guy. I really think it's a complex system of participants. And so, uh, we, we encountered a little bit of resistance in terms of support. And I was really disappointed because, uh, but luckily the student group came through and made the event wonderful. But I mean, we had, again, people around the country watching it or at least listening to it. Uh, and we had, um, I, I know we did because I saw the, the, the numbers on YouTube and I know we had a lot of press around the, around the Worcester show. And I felt that it could have been a really positive thing if the, uni if the administration even pushed their own folks to attend so that we could have a real like discourse about this because this isn't it's not an attack on education i value it more than maybe anything in the world it really is just kind of a, a criticism of how uh we've sort of come to fund um higher education and it, and if the way we fund have funded it in certain ways and for-profit schools and even non-profit schools how this is becoming a dangerous thing and i think any school willing to have that conversation that's a progressive move that's a really thoughtful thing to do because once you start saying, well, we're not going to talk about this, then you've lost the foundation of what made you a university to begin with or a college. Right. And so that, so I can't, I don't know specifically what it was, but I pretty much got sort of just general emails of why they wanted to, but they wanted to stop the show at some point. They were going to basically put a halt to it, but I have to give credit to the, the student union. This group, they were, what a brave group of people because I, it is bravery. I mean, really they were putting, themselves and their organization and their future funding at risk right. uh, just to present the show. And I felt that, again, it wasn't about me. It was they really felt that having a dialogue about this issue was that important. So yeah. that's a little bit about the kind of resistance that we that we got there. Well, that was that was good. And, and you know, part of what prompted that question was you you actually said from the stage um, at the closing that you expressed your gratitude for the bravery of the students and the participants in the in the theater at that evening and it was it was really telling because i think taking this show into universities uh, is i mean you're totally going to the belly of the beast whether or not they're they're part of that whole mechanism the same issues are you know up for discussion you know debt is debt however it's accumulated um of course taking on you know, private or state college debt is is a different mechanism, but it's still an issue. And so good for you for taking it um, right to the source and doing it in such a professional and non-confrontational way. You know, you're just pushing it out for, for conversation. 
Um, and I'm getting a little bit of an error here, so hang on just a minute, and we'll see. There, I think I just had a little internet hiccup. Are we good on the channel? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to say we're good until I hear different. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, what has been your audience responses across the board? Like, you, you've, I mean, you've toured this a lot. I mean, you've had a good run so far. What's the audience response has been like? I think um, generally positive about the, uh, the content. I think people are, are surprised. Um, and I think a lot of people, again, you know, you, you go into it uh, because I think we're saturated with a lot of stuff. I think we're saturated with a lot of semantics in our life where, you know, something is kind of headlined as one thing and you go into it and it's not, it doesn't engage in a, in a truthful way. And I think that's what at least theater allows you to do, or, or I would say uh, thoughtful theater is that you can, you know, you, you, people are, um, they, they're unmasked. So when they come into the theater, they're not the accountant. They're not the. They can take that mask off. They can take maybe even that political mask off and just be a human being for an hour, uh, outside of all that stuff. And I think so. The the response has been really positive. We've also surprisingly, I you know I didn't want to do the show specifically to a um, per, to a particular group. So I didn't want to just say, well, I just want to be patted on the back by you know, you know, independent friends or progressive friends. I, you know, I really wanted to, to, to challenge folks. And we've had a lot of um, people who are, you know, conservative or libertarians or people who come to see the show um, who maybe on the surface go, I don't know, this just sounds like another whiny college, you know, former college student. But they come in and they go, you know what, we, at least for this issue, it was really um, something that was uh, that was uh, brought people together. So there was a sort of a I haven't had any really like there's a, of course there's a few people you know on the, on, you know you have articles and people say stuff like you know oh, do you get a job or you know stuff like that. But you just kind of go whatever. You know, it's not substantive. But I mean for the people who've seen the show, it's been really positive and it's it's like a bipartisan I guess experience because you know there is a, it's not a even though there's I guess you can say like political tones to it. Uh, I, I think I presented it in a way where it's not, you know, I'm not, you know, pushing a particular agenda. Um, however, I think it's just a really, it's been really great. And that's been the most positive thing is that you have, we can't, again, it shows in a micro example uh, for the show, it shows what we can do, you know, that they, they can't do in Washington. And I think that's what art, art does, is it, it, in theater specifically, is it can literally bring people of entirely different viewpoints, ideologies, together on a human point. And then if you can get there, then you can actually create any sort of change or even introduce policy that could that create change because you're talking about it at a human level. So I think that's been the most the, the best reaction that I've gotten is just people, no matter their ideology, their political background, coming up to me and saying, man, that was really, really, really informative. Uh, I know something I didn't know or even better, I see, I see what's happening and I'm wondering if there's a way I can sort of, you know, be an, an activist in my own way to kind of figure this this thing through. Um, and we need that at all levels, I think. I mean, you're doing it with this kind of conversation, uh, with these type of real, you know, when, when do you get an hour to actually sit down and talk with someone about something, you know, real? Um, anywhere in the media, online, live streaming, television, anywhere. Uh, so you're doing it in this form. I feel like I'm doing it with this form, with higher education. We need more of this type of arts intersection with activism on all sections from, you know, from politics to, you know, poverty. We need more of that because I really believe that the, the, the role of the artist isn't this sort of flimsy thing that's been sort of stigmatized. I really believe it's an, it's an ambassador of someone who is a, a connector. Um, you know, I don't have the chops as a politician. I don't have the chops of, as an economist. Um, but I do have, I think, the chops as a connector from people who feel something and then want the betterment for most people and how can we build that bridge so I think um, seeing the results of that from the audience and seeing kind of seeing that take in a small way and come to fruition that's been great and that's that's been awesome to see from them um you, I I am really heartened to hear that and you're you're speaking my language you know we we come at it from from different angles but I think with the same sort of in a global vision of that. Um, I was wondering, you know, you're playing mostly in universities, it sounds like. How are your demographics? You know, are you getting a pretty good cross-section of people that come to the shows? 
Yeah, I mean, st uh, students, teachers, community members, different ethnicities, um, you know, we're, it's, a, it's a mix. I think, one, being at a university, it helps that. Mm -hmm. Because naturally, a lot of these schools, you have just a mixture of people from around the country, even around the world, different perspectives and religions and, and things like that. Um, but in terms of just the, uh, you know, the, the diversity, it isn't, you know, it isn't just student crowds. I mean, we have, you know, a lot of different people coming from different parts of the community. I mean, and, and I think, you know, at the universities, I, uh, there is obviously probably more students there than a traditional venue. Um, but, you know, you know we, I did a show earlier on in, in last, last year when I was starting off. It was sponsored by Occupy Dayton. And we did it at, like, the Occupy Dayton space in the basement of like a church and it was it was it was amazing and it was you know in a part of town that was you know uh, that had been really hard hit by the economy that is not something maybe you want to drive around at late at night but it was people came to the show a lot of people came to the show and it was amazing because you know it was it was folks from that community mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing too is you know again for the for the commercial aspect of the of the play for the funding aspect of the play you know you can't always do shows, you know, in at in at risk neighborhoods at the bottom of a church. However, I think at the same time, it, it's at least for me an obligation to take. You know, I, I always hated, you know, being going to a production, or seeing some sort of art or even event that's talking about problems of people in particular areas, or of an income level, or of an experience. But they do the show in like a place where those people don't live. Right, disconnected. They do. Yeah, and and uh, and again, that's not to say anything about the folks who are hosting that event. That's a great thing to host it, but I feel like if you don't host it on the other side of the tracks, if it's an event that's really dealing with the social, let's find a medium where we can get folks from 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 communities of you know, people who do have student debt or who are who are dealing with poverty or dealing with you know the immigrant experience or dealing with being laid off from you know uh, something agricultural in North Carolina or industrial in Cleveland. I mean, something where where we can have a cross section. I think, again, because of the universities, that's been helpful. They can draw that in in terms of you know publicity and working with me to publicize and organize the event. But I've done a number of shows as well where it's just been 100% community based, where we take it there. And truthfully, the more that I do, and the, and I think I didn't answer it fully. You asked what's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is is to is to continue to tour this. Um, for as long as I can, and to add to that sort of national discourse uh, from with from the play as well as from my work organizing with student debt crisis, but also to get as many people as possible to get talking and to get active with this show. So I guess the the mission I have a, like our mission statement is to stimulate um, civil discourse about you know the financial economic crisis of the American student. And so any way that we can do that, you know, that's, uh, that's the key. And that's not just in universities, and that's not just in theaters. And the more, uh, as the show grows, my hope is that I can continue to do more work that's actually um, connected more with the community uh, and do more shows that can actually go into neighborhoods. Um, you know, and, but that, you know, that all depends on the growth of the show. But I think we're off to a, off to a good start, so that's a good sign. Um, so that is a good segue to my next question about the the value and impact of live theater slash live performance compared to film or TV or recorded performance, um, which seems like an obvious question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because um, it's hard to get people out. I mean, I do I do shows too, you know, in our our community. And it's hard to yeah. get people out, but so what do you tell tell me about the value of that and some of the challenges you have around that? Because you you are a very good organizer and promoter. Just working on this with you, I mean, I can see that. So you you know you know you have to go out and engage and draw people in. So live performance versus you know recorded, say. Yeah, I think um, it, it's interesting because it was an opposite experience for me. I, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier uh, that I I was really focused more. I was interested in film. I, I acted. I, my training was mostly on film, on camera, uh, and so that was my sort of. And there's there's such value in that, you know, as you know, you know, documentaries and, and different films that are just you can capture things on film um, that are that are unique and that are compelling. But again, with the solo form, I was sort of a late bloomer, but I. Because I, again, stereotypically always thought, ah, theater, eh. 
but as when you get into it, as you know, when you get into it and you realize the effect that you have live in an audience when it's something, uh, you know, uh, when you really are vulnerable on stage and you're talking about something real uh, and everybody can see themselves in you. And that's the thing. I mean, you serve as a mirror. The play serves as a mirror to human beings collectively. And I think it's such an interesting thing, even going to the movies live, you know, or going to theater. You know, it's a weird thing. You know, a group of people go to a place, they turn the lights off, and then we watch people on stage or on screen pretend to be real. That, that, that's, I mean, that's, and, and we, we need that as a reflector to even organize our own thoughts and actions about our own lives. So to your question, I think for me, the live performance, there's nothing, there's nothing more stimulating, nothing better, especially for this type of solo work and storytelling, because, I mean, it goes as far back as, you know, the guy around the campfire talking about the hunt and what, you know, what part of the woods not to go to. And, you know, he, it's that pure and it's that real. And I think that's why I really like it because it gets to the source of a human being sharing with other human beings. And then at some point, all of us meeting in some place. Um, and, and having different viewpoints on it and having different experiences, but there's that commonality. So I think you can only get that live experience in the theater. Um, and, and to your point, man, is it hard to get people to come out to, to shows. And that's not, that's anybody. And, and it, whether it's any, it could be the greatest show in the world, could be commercial shows, could be, you know, independent work like mine. But I, I've noticed that that's where the, the organizing part of me has really came in was like, I know people feel better after they see a, p a good piece of work and they go, you know what, I kind of didn't feel like I was going to go out to see it, but I'm really glad that I did. Mm -hmm. I, think the theater, I think the theater forces us to engage in a civil way that we aren't engaging in. And that could be pr because of technology, that could be because of convenience, uh, and all those things are great because look at, you know, I guess the, with the, the, the Catch-22, you know, we can have a conversation like this and, you know, we have this forum now where we can open this up to people. You're in, we're in different states. What a blessing this is. At the same time, the same technology will prevent someone or maybe kind of make it where I can just see it on TV or I right, can, right. you know. So, so my thing is theater is that lasting form that, that engages someone to literally, it's an activity. You get up out of your house. You go to a place. You, in, you, you are forced to engage with other human beings, and then you see a living, breathing person or, or, or persons on stage. And so there is no greater impact than that. Uh, and so that's why I think, you know, that's to me the value. And I, I noticed even, you know, you, it's hard to film theater. It doesn't look good on film. Any, any actor, you know, that, you, that you'll talk to, you know, whether they're independent or, you know, making Hollywood movies, they'll tell you, you know, you, like there's nothing worse than seeing yourself on, being filmed in theater. It's just the aesthetic. It's just it's just hard to capture it because it doesn't cre it doesn't capture that live essence. So that's the thing that I hope compels people, not with just my play, but in events in general, mm -hmm. whether it's community theater, regional theater. It's it's one of those things that I think it just it just it, it makes you feel alive when you go out and you take part in something, um, and you 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 come home or wherever you live with something uh, like like a live show or a live experience, especially one that makes you think. Yeah, it's it's physical, and you have conversations, and it's tactile, which is what I, I like about it. And I love doing live shows, and I love going to them for that reason. And my experience is, both on either side of the, the stage, it runs hot and cold. You, know, you just never know. and But you go out there and do it, and I think it's, it's so valuable to do. Um, and I really appreciate the fact you're doing it. And and so this leads me to my next question because you touched on that. Um, how does this new media, which you know I define it digital media as new media, live stream and Twitter and Facebook and you know YouTube and all that. How do you feel that fits into the distribution of stories like the ones you want to tell or the ones that I want to share? How how effective do you think it is? Um, what are the pluses and minuses around that well again it's one of those you know it's the catch-22 thing it's so um, specifically it is essential to my work um, that 
that form, Facebook, Twitter, uh, any type of social media platform is not only essential to my work, but I know is essential to most uh, most artists who are doing uh, socially conscious work or even independent work. It is it is a great equalizer. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to. You know, the myth of Los Angeles and the myth of New York. Um, you know, you don't. You can be in an urban area, uh, contribute to your community. Um, you can be anywhere. You know, that's just not limited to urban areas. I know there's certain things that um, having a city or a major metropolitan area give an artist, but at the same time, I just think it's it's it, it's the great equalizer, mm-hmm. uh, and and it has been essential. Without without it, without you know Skype and Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, I wouldn't. I my play may have not made it out of uh, you know Cleveland or even stopped after New York right. because literally it was I was able to connect in a meaningful way, not just with audience members, but then other organizations. And then they could then see my work because it was open and they could have access to my website and all that different stuff. So it's absolutely essential. And it's such a, it's such a blessing to have it as a tool. Um, The only, again, the only negative drawback is, is that sometimes with theater, you use this form to get the word out about stuff, but then people are so connected with this type of, media or technology that they sometimes are inhibited to not go out right. to see stuff. Um, and that's not everybody, but I'm saying, you know, a lot of folks, you know, it's like if it's not something they can access with their fingertip, you know, they won't, they won't do it. Um, and so I think that leap of faith is the one challenge that, you know, that I have. Uh, and I think anybody, like you said, you've, you've, you've done shows that the challenge is like, how, you know, how can we have a balance? And I think that's the key thing with, with everything. I think it's, I hope that it's at least the theme of my play where even ironic, you know, the for-profit is, yes, it describes a type of educational institution, but at the same time, profit or even profit based on your labor or being paid meaningful for your work, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's at what, at what cost and where is that balance? And I think the same thing goes for the, the, the social media platform. Um, you know, you know, at times it can also be, you know, uh, misleading where, you know, you get lots of people retweeting and lots of people doing this stuff and it's great and people talk about it. But at the same time, you know, I think that's a great way to get people to the show. And I think, or, or the event or whatever it is, the event itself is the most important thing. Uh, but, but again, intrinsically connected with that is the fact that I have an opportunity and many thousands of artists have opportunities if they're doing relevant work and, and found a way to do it with a, with a niche, they can use this to their advantage. So I would say more pluses than minuses, mm-hmm. uh, but there is still is that little bit of a, you know, you know, uh, there's no organizing like direct organizing, like being in front of people doing theater, that kind of stuff. There's nothing more compelling than that. At the same time, if these type of platforms and they have, have given rise to numerous artists and numerous activists and organizations, and, 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 and people creating discourse and conversation like yourself have given us platforms to have this. This is, a, this is essential because, you know, our voices are, are really valuable. Yep. I actually, you know, my perspective is, you know, because this is how, how we do our shows mostly, but the value that I find in digital media is it enabled me to participate in one of your shows. There's no other way I could have done that. And from that, we get to have the conversation. So I'm always, sure. the, all, all my, the viewers we have and people who hear me, I'm, I'm always pontificating about, we have more communication tools than ever existed in the history of the universe, but less real communication. And that's the danger because, you know, there's a, there's a wall between us with, with these tools. But if we use those tools to build bridges, to walk over, to get to the live events and to get face to face and to have conversations, then then it's the best of both worlds. Uh, yes. For what that's worth. So um, I want to get there's some chatters that have some questions. Let me get back to them. Um, everybody is extremely impressed that you're doing the shows for free, um, and I I have experience in that way too. And I think this is a good question for for people who aren't familiar. But I have somebody asking. Um, how are you able to do the shows for free? Like, how are you able to support all the infrastructure and the traveling and the expenses, but be able to do the shows for the audiences for free? 
Uh, so it's just the, the way we've been able to put together the financial package. So my event coordinator and I uh, worked, you know, tirelessly for a number of months of how to kind of create a formula that worked. Uh, and then the idea was putting together a price package, just like, you know, a guest speaker goes or they bring in guest lecturers, they have particular fees and stuff like that. Right. Um, the, the benefit with my show is that I can tour it and I don't have like 20 people and a mm -hmm. truck. Right. So it, it drastically inherently the form, the solo form lowers the overhead of the of the so just from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's just literally it's um, it's reasonable business where I can offer something that has a nice uh, uh, impact just in terms of the, the sort of uh, the momentum the play has gotten and the, and the type of and the number of people talking about it and that kind of stuff. Um, and the number of shows that it's so it's, it's been proven in a way, I guess, even as, a, as in the first year. Um, at the same time, you know, like you said, as an artist, and this is this is my trade. So then, you know, the artist needs to get paid, which would, in this case would be me. And then, and then at the same time, we also need, like you said, travel. So we just for each, you know, I have there's like an in-state rate. So if I do shows in Ohio, uh, there's a particular rate that we have that's that's um, that doesn't rely as much on travel because I can get around easier. And then when we do out of state, we have a rate, and everything is all inclusive in the rate. So basically, you know, it it includes basic travel necessities, um, you know, things like you know, uh, basic housing, including at the universities as well. Is that a lot of times they have guest housing that's part of the infrastructure. So I'm not staying at like the Hilton and things like that. So right. it's a way to even even the way we put together that is a way to be beneficial to both parties because even though I, I really believe in you know everyone who does work and creates labor you know should be rewarded in some way for that labor value uh, at the same time I also my job isn't to like you know try to you know get try to take the school or the theater for all their worth that's not what it's about right. how can I have a fair exchange of commerce where I provide a service and they provide compensation so we've been able to put reasonable packages together which cover the travel which pay me for the show, I think, in a, in, a fair, uh, in a fair way. At the same time, it also makes it accessible for different universities. And lastly, to that question, I've been able to, with just kind of creating relationships, a lot of the times I have a coalition of organizations from the universities who co-sponsor it. Mm -hmm. So even in that sense, they are not individually economically burdened to a point where, hey, we used all our funding just for this one show. So even for this last show in Worcester, it was great because – not only was it a statement, I think, that we had a bipartisan kind of aspect because we had libertarians and socialists and the student government and, you know, all of them together co-sponsored the show. That's awesome. So, yeah, so it's like, yeah, again, on a micro scale, like, can we just send this formula to Washington? But, I, but it was, it was like, because, again, you know, even with those different ideologies, they saw this, you know, not only the debt crisis, but the 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 student student debt and the dilemmas of for profits and so to speak as as a necessary conversation to have, so I think I've been able to tap into that and then with the 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 coalitions of organizations they can pool their wealth, pool their money it's not wealth but they pool their funds together I should say, mm -hmm. and then be able to and then I get compensated for my work. Right. So again, you know, it's not, it's not a silver bullet and there's always challenges and there's, you know, times where I can't do certain places and, you know, but generally there's been no issues because that, that's that formula, at least for now seems to work where, you know, we can present the work. It's free of charge because I'm paid upfront. Cause again, at the beginning, I was telling you, one of the worst things was I, even when I was doing the show at first, in order to do it, we had to charge ticket prices, hmm. um, and that was, you know, that was okay. And most people do it that way. But I, not only did I feel like it was weird for the content of the show, I also felt that um, I didn't like the anxiety because I'm, I'm backstage. I'm going, okay, is there 50 people in the audience or is there 60? And they're like, oh, great, I can pay my rent, and then my next student loan bill. That's not what, you know, that's not a way to live, and, right. and that's not for the art. I didn't want it to be that way, where I was trying to get seats in there so that I could pay my bill. So. I think having an artist fee and creating a formula that way where we have like an invoice and an, everything is covered up front and then we don't worry about anything else. They can have, you know, a hundred people there. We can show it to a million people. And as long as for that particular show, we're compensated in a fair and, and just way, then, Hey, that's, that's, that's fair. So it seems to work out. And that's yep. sort of how we went about doing that. I think it's a really workable model. I've done something similar myself mm -hmm. and I've always been satisfied. And I think the key to that is the whole fair exchange idea, you know, yeah. and, and my, my experience has been with institutions and organizations. They're pretty receptive to that. You know, you just say, 
here it is, this is what I need to do it, and I'll do it, and it's clean and, and neat, and it makes it socially and economically accessible for a much broader audience, which is, yeah. you know, what the whole crux of the biscuit is, right? Uh, yes, see, sir. the next question is, uh, do you see admissions counselors resisting uh, or groups of college administrators forming that oppose the uh, for-profit schemes? Um, with, well, let me, uh, maybe I can clarify it. Within the actual for-profits themselves or within like uh, general, like, uh, well, I'll, I'll say it this way. Let me answer it so maybe it, it takes on both. Um, Within the institutions themselves, there's not a ton of resistance. I mean, it's it's people generally doing this for a living. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily, they know that maybe something's going wrong. Um, they, I felt it. Maybe it was because I wasn't part of the system because it was the most jarring experience <laughs> of my life. And I don't know how people don't have like, you know, like a hundred ulcers every, you know. Um, but again, you know, the, a lot, you know, there's teachers that work there, and these are folks that you know are, are 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 good teachers, and it's not fair to them as well because they're looking for work. The for-profit hires adjuncts primarily, so they have very low pay and very you know very few be benefits. And at the same time, they got you know you know uh, people like me when I was working as admissions advisor, listening to the boss who says enroll any human being that's breathing. And so now you have a classroom of folks that you know, it's not really conducive for teaching or learning. You know, it's right. really like it's a, it's a it's this business. It's this sort of you know pump it out, pump it out kind of thing. It's manufactured and, uh, education, right? I mean, the education exactly. is the product, and so everything is the manufacturing of the product, and everybody loses that way. Everyone loses. And, and, and I say it, too, I think just the feel of at least the institution I, I was associated with, and, and I think many institutions, based on my research and talking with folks um, who worked or who formerly worked at these schools, uh, it's it really feels like a used car sales lot. I mean, and that's not to say that anybody does, but you know what I'm saying in the sense mm -hmm. that that it's not you know again, there's a place for a used car sales lot in our economy. There's a place for privatization. There's a place for this, but my my view, and and, and again, I don't I don't uh, I don't think I get too didactic about it in the show, but I really believe that 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 education we should think carefully about how we treat it. That maybe things like education aren't um, tenants that we should poison with just making as much as possible. Maybe there are certain things that we can say, you know what, that's off limits. And however we fund it and make it work, let's make it more of a fair trade thing. You know, we have other venues. If you want to make millions of dollars, go do this. Or if you want to, if you want to try to make commission, go do this. There's a lot of other ventures that you can take on in this complex economy where you're not just, you know, getting as many in as possible and getting as many out. That model is great for some things. I don't think it's great for education. And so within the industry, with, I didn't see a lot of resistance. There's a few folks, and you can read articles about them, um, who, have, <clears throat> who have spoken up, who are whistleblowers. Uh, and so you'll see articles here and there um, where people are, ha were interviewed for television specials or, um, um, or, or, or you know, newspaper articles where they have basically come out. Or there was um, people who've testified uh, when they did there, the, a lot of these universities were under federal investigation, and during that process, during the hearings, a lot of advisors went in and w was really brave. I mean, they went in and they they admitted what they did. So we have a few really brave folks who were in that industry who weren't artists or who were maybe folks who were who had been in it for a long time, and that must have been even harder for them. In terms of the so that if that answers the question, I hope it does. But in terms of the larger scale, there isn't really a, you know in the nonprofits and the public universities. They, they acknowledge for profits, but there isn't really a, I don't even think they see them in the same sort of realm. They, they see what's happening, but unlike me, they don't see the direct connection between, you know, what student debt is, and they don't see that there's a connection between our institution and their institution. Right. And I think, I think that's true to a point. At the same time, what's, what's, what a lot of public schools are even seeing as well, and some of them have started to adapt, was that business-wise, the for-profit model was really successful. I mean, if you didn't have this federal investigation and, and this debt crisis in the economy the way it was, uh, and, and now we have a little bit more oversight, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like just purely business-wise economically, 
it was successful. So my fear and my hope, I guess, with doing the work is that that we can get all educational institutions to realize that this general tone, uh, obviously for profits being sort of the uh, polarized example of that, but this general sentiment of, hey, you know, let's charge as much as we can, get students, you know, let's kind of try to reform that. So, um, you know, a little bit of resistance, but if there was that much resistance, they wouldn't exist. Right. And so this is a follow-up question to that, and I, I think you, you pretty much answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, is there any degree of accountability in a for-profit institution for the quality of the education a student is receiving, as far as you can so, tell? <laughs> yeah, so, well, one of the things, um, th you know, they have like accreditation, so it's the, uh, the Higher Education Association or the higher, uh, I can't think of the, the, the letters off the top of my head, but there are accrediting bodies um, that basically some schools are accredited and some schools aren't. Mm -hmm. A lot of the for-profits, um, some of them uh, are seeking that accreditation or what they call regional accreditation. Regional accreditation is usually the, the, the thumbs up mm -hmm. uh, because it means you have a third party that is coming in there and they're seeing that the quality of education is being monitored and this and that. A lot of the for-profit schools, generally most of them, don't have that type of accreditation. Um, they don't have that regional accreditation. They have a different type of accreditation. A lot of it's, it's called national accreditation, which is sort of like a convoluted thing where um, it sounds good, you know, national accreditation, it must be good. But in actuality, but in actuality, um, without that accreditation, many of these students can't get work. Um, if for an example, if you are at a for-profit school that doesn't have accreditation for like a nursing degree or a health information management degree, many of those professions, um, whether you see it as right or wrong, but they, they do, they have a lot of testing afterwards mm -hmm. where you have to take certain boards that are sanctioned by the state. And, and what a lot of students don't realize is that if you don't have an accredited degree, that would prohibit you from taking those tests. So I, I, could count, I could count on my hands countless examples of students who we, that we enrolled in programs that weren't fully accredited. Now we were allowed to have them essentially as test programs. And what we were told to say was that, well, you know, uh, the accreditation, you'll get grandfathered in. So you'll be here for two years, so don't worry. Even if it's not now, by the time it's over, you'll be good. Yeah. So, yeah. When they left, now they got now they got forty thousand dollars in debt. They got a degree, and they can't even take the test to take the job, and that's that is a, that is criminal. And the fact that most of these schools are being funded by taxpayer dollars, that's why the show is so important as well. This is public funding. This is primarily public funding that they're funneling from taxpayer dollars to do this to human beings, and in and, and an economic sense. You know, I don't mean to be over dramatic, but really in an economic sense, that's econo that's an economic violence that's subtle, but that's dangerous. Right. Uh, and that's why I think most people who, who are taxpayers or pay some sort of tax need to know that, look, these institutions, hey, this is a free market, but th this isn't right. So that's a little bit of the insight to how, how that worked. And that's, that's where it gets really kind of, it gets hairy. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that was, I'm glad I asked that question because um, you you did give some more insight. So um, what call to action would you like to leave for viewers and, and your audiences as we go to wrap this up? Yeah, I would say one, if, if you see the show or if you've been, um, you know, if you've read about the show or if you read about a lot of the uh, work that Student Debt Crisis has done and some of our other organizations I've mentioned, I think the call to action is just literally just open up a little bit of awareness. Make everyone so busy with their life. Everyone's got a, everyone, especially with the climate, economic climate, you have family and you have life and you have dreams, and you have hope, you have all, the, all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, I would, I would caution people to let them know that, that this student debt crisis, not just the for-profit um, industry. I mean, as you mentioned, this was just a lens or, or a gateway, so to speak, for me to start this larger conversation, whether it's for-profits, non-profits, student debt, debt culture, you know, credit cards, mortgage crisis, predatory lending, all these type of things. This is at its root core. This is something that's, um, I think, really dangerous to our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that it is. 
uh, my contention is that the student loan crisis is directly connected in some way to the economic stagnation that we have continued today because most people with this type of debt um, aren't able to be economically stimulative. Um, they can't do the things, not that makes them rich, but that helps businesses, that helps you know, upward mobility. Um, and so my thing would be just open up a sense of awareness within yourself. And that could be as easy as reading an article about it or you know, looking up information about the play or looking up about the organizations just because everyone has different space for different type of awareness in their life. Some people have the means to actually spend more time and you know, um, you know, call their local you know, politician or their senator or, or to go to a rally or to go to a show. And some people you know, just you know, have time to read an article for five minutes. But I would just implore anybody, no action is not good action. Any sort of action is good action. And so the more people we have talking about it, if it's casual, if it's through conferences, if it's coming to a show, just spend one little moment of your day considering what's happening with the student debt crisis. And I think at the end, what we'll see is if enough voices talk about it, some louder than others, but if enough of us are loud about it, we'll eventually down the road see some sort of change for the long term. Um, I, I love that. It's like it, no any action is better than no action. It's fantastic. Um, I want to uh, – no, I'm going to pass over that one. Um, I want to thank you so much, Aaron, for being here with us tonight. It was an absolute pleasure and very enlightening. I know you're a busy guy and got a lot in the air, and I appreciate you taking the time out to spend with us. Thanks for having me. This was – this was uh... It was, this was awesome. I appreciate the conversation. Yep. And uh, all the viewers and chatters have asked me to express their, their appreciation for the work you're doing and give you thanks and just tell you to be strong and keep at it. And any way we can help get your message out, you know, we're in. So um, know you have a, another ally that you've made across the ether. And, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you down south sometime soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Great. Have a good night, and thank you for being you on. Too. Take care. I appreciate it. Take care.